Kathy. I'd like to thank my sister Michelle for that beautiful prayer. And if you'll indulge me, uh, Michelle and I'd like to take the liberty of saying hello to our sister Cindy in Topeka, Kansas, who would have who wanted to be here today with us, but she just had her fifth child a few days ago and thought the timing was poor. I asked her what the big deal was, but she thought <laughs> it was too soon. That's spoken by a woman who's never had a baby, you're saying. <laughs> we wish she were here. We, we miss her and love her. I'd like to also just tell you how much I love the two women I sit with on this, pulp, on this podium. It's been my great pleasure and privilege this last year to serve under the direction of President Smoot and to learn from her and President Jensen. They are wonderful women. They are great women because they're so good. And believe me, it has taken a great deal of charity on their part to put up with me and my crazy schedule, and I, I cannot tell you how I have grown to love them. I, I wish you could sit in some of our presidency meetings and feel the tremendous love that these women have for all of us and the great desire President Smoot has to, to have every one of us feel involved and valued. I think it's no small thing. It shows great courage on her part, in my opinion, that she had the courage to call a woman who had never been married and who has to have a full-time job to serve as one of her counselors. She is a wonderful woman. So I'm grateful for the experience I've had this past year. <clears throat> Let me begin by telling you that my mother made me take piano lessons. <laughs> Are you laughing because you're a mother that's making your children take piano <laughs> lessons? Or because your mother made you take piano lessons? And because I'm her eldest child and she had not yet been worn down by the absolutely thankless task of prodding five children to practice every day, my whining about practicing fell on deaf ears. The fact that I eventually studied the piano for about 15 years is largely a tribute to mother's resilience. I wish I had a dollar for every time she prophesied that I'd thank her one day for all that musical torture. <laughs> you know what? I have thanked her again and again for that introduction to the keyboard because somewhere between those first bars of here we go up a row to a birthday party. Was that your first song you learned? <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I hope that gal doesn't give up her day job. <laughs> Somewhere between that and Rhapsody in Blue, I fell in love with music, especially classical music, which in its more magnificent pages and passages made my heart feel like it was going to leap out of my chest. In other words, it, make my young, it made my young spirit soar. Here again, mom deserves all the credit. I couldn't have been more than 10 when she gave me a stack of classical albums, which introduced me to some of the great composers whose works were characterized by dramatic musical passages and what I call the big finish. I love music that has a big finish. And I would lie in front of the stereo for hours listening to the third movement of Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto or to his prelude in C-sharp minor, all the while imagining myself at a shiny black concert grand in Carnegie Hall. I pictured my debut there, standing ovation and all. I imagined that I would be humble about it, but brilliant. <laughs> brilliant enough to move an entire audience and especially my mother to tears. Well, somewhere in all of this daydreaming, I caught a vision of how it would feel to play so beautifully that others' hearts would soar. At that point, Mother no longer had to encourage me to practice. Once I had a vision of the possibilities, the motivation to master the piano came from inside. Now, was practicing suddenly enjoyable? No, absolutely not. It was usually sheer drudgery. But I found a technique that helped me endure those tedious hours of practice day in and day out. When I set out to tackle a new piece, I would master and memorize the big finish first, all the while visualizing myself in concert where the audience jumped to its feet at the last chord. And then at the beginning of each practice session, I would play the big finish first, and there in the basement of our farm home, I would bow to my imaginary audience. 
Imagining how grand the big finish would be kept me going through months of rehearsal on technical passages that didn't provide nearly the same sense of drama, but that had to be mastered nonetheless. In short, my progress on the piano and my motivation to practice increased dramatically when I caught a vision of my potential. Now, sisters, we are all temporarily afflicted with the amnesia of mortality. But just as my spirit was stirred by the majesty of those dramatic musical passages and the possibility of performing them flawlessly, through the power of the spirit, we can often catch a spark, as Joseph F. Smith taught us, from the awakened memories of the immortal soul, which lights up our whole being as with the glory of our former home. It is the spirit that will also shed light upon our ultimate potential, which is the grandest finish of all. If, on the other hand, we are not able to catch a vision of the big finish, meaning a clear image of who we are and what we are becoming, we won't be motivated to practice. Life, like classical music, is full of difficult passages that are conquered as much through endurance and determination as any particular skill. Remember those announcements that used to interrupt your regularly scheduled television programming? This is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. It is only a test. If this were a real emergency, you'd have been notified through this station. Well, you've probably seen the poster that reads, live is a test. It's only a test. Had this been a real life, you would have been instructed <laughs> where to go and what to do. It kind of reminds me of a greeting card that a good friend gave me that shows an absolutely frazzled woman who says, mother told me there would be days like this, but she failed to mention they could go on for months at a time. <laughs> there are times, aren't there, when days feel like months and when life feels like the test that it is. Days when the vision and hope of a big finish are dimmed by immediate demands and pressures. Days when one might wish for a mortal exam that was a little more manageable. For indeed, this life is a test. It is only a test, meaning that's all it is. Nothing more, but nothing less. It's a test of many things, of our convictions and our priorities, our faith and our faithfulness, our patience and our resilience, and in the end, our ultimate desires. For in the long run, as Alma taught us, whatever we truly desire, we will have. It's a scary thought when you think about it. Quote, I know that God granteth unto men according to their desire. Yea, I know that he allotteth unto men according to their wills, whether they be unto salvation or unto destruction, unquote. Thankfully, our experience here is an open book test. We know why we're here, and we have, from prophets ancient and modern, an extensive set of instructions that never become passe or grow outdated. Life is a test of many things, but at the risk of sounding terribly simplistic, may I suggest that the poor mortal experience is largely a test of vision, our vision of ourselves and the ultimate our ultimate big finish. Vision is determined by and connected to our faith. The firmer our faith in Jesus Christ, the clearer our vision of ourselves and what we can ultimately achieve and become. Now the adversary, on the other ha hand, is intent on obstructing our vision and undermining our faith. He will do anything and everything to confuse us about who we are and where we're going. And the reason? Because he's already forfeited his privilege of going there. A vision of our potential is central to survival, both spiritually and physically. I've always been a little curious about Lehi and his family. I want you to imagine the family home evening when Lehi comes home and tells his wife and children that the Lord has directed them to pack a few belongings because they're going to march into the wilderness. I doubt anybody was enthused about the news. Can't you kind of imagine the dialogue? You want us to do what? We're supposed to pack a few things and leave home. Yes, that is what the Lord has asked us to do. Well, where are we going? I'm not entirely sure. I only know we're to leave Jerusalem, and by the way, we're going to travel light, so leave most of your things here. Well, when are we coming back home? That's not entirely clear, perhaps never. We know how Laman and Lemuel responded, initially and in perpetuity. Why didn't Nephi, their younger brother, react the same way? He probably wasn't thrilled with the news either. The difference, I believe, is an absolutely classic demonstration of the power of vision. 
While Laman and Lemuel whined and rebelled, Nephi asked the Lord if he might see what his father had seen. He had the faith to seek his own vision. Quote, I, Nephi, did cry unto the Lord, and behold, he did visit me, and did soften my heart that I did believe all the words which had been spoken by my father. Wherefore, I did not rebel against him like unto my brothers. That vision, or sense of purpose, sustained Nephi through a life of trial and tribulation. It helped him pass his test. Joseph Smith was persecuted from the time he announced that he had seen the father and the son until he died a martyr. How did he do it? Let us never forget that his prophetic mission began with a vision. Quote, I have actually seen a vision, and who am I that I can withstand God? Or why does the world think to make me deny what I have actually seen? For I had seen a vision. I knew it. And I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it, neither dared I do it. At least I knew that by so doing, I would offend God and come under condemnation." Unquote. Where there is no vision, the people perish, Solomon proclaimed. Perhaps nothing is more vital today than having a vision manifest by the Spirit of who we are and what we can become, of our intrinsic value to the Lord and of the unparalleled role we must play in these latter days. We are literally the offspring of God, His begotten sons of daughters, with the potential of exaltation. Quote, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ." Unquote. How do we get a clear vision of who we are? How do we gain an internal perspective that is compelling enough to move us to action and to govern our choices and our priorities? From whence cometh the vision? I'm a little sensitive to this issue of vision at the moment because I have, I'm going through that midlife eye crisis where I can't seem to hold things far enough away for me to read them. I've noticed lately my tendency to turn on lamps and lights everywhere I can. That's because light is a key to vision, and Jesus Christ is the ultimate light, the light which shineth in darkness, the light which chases darkness from among us. The light created by our faith in Jesus Christ is the key to our vision, to seeing ourselves as the Lord sees us. So to improve our vision, we must improve, increase and improve our faith in and connection to the Savior. It's no accident that the first principle of the gospel is faith. President Gordon B. Hinckley has said that of all our needs, the greatest is an increase in faith. In Alma's brilliant discourse, we're told, if ye will awake and arouse your faculties, even to an experiment upon my words, and exercise a particle of faith, Yea, if ye can no more than desire to believe, let this desire work in you, even until ye believe in a manner that ye can give place for a portion of my words. Can't you just hear the Savior saying, if you only want to believe that I'll do for you what I've said I do, will do, will you try it? Will you experiment? Put me to the test. As Lehi and his family learned, their Leahona worked according to their faith. When they became slothful in their devotions and ceased to exercise faith, the marvelous work ceased. This is in keeping with divine law, for as James E. Talmage taught, faith is of itself a principle of power, and by its presence or absence, even the Lord was and is influenced and in great measure controlled in the bestowal or withholding of blessings." Unquote. Therefore, let us not be slothful because of the easiness of the way the way is prepared that if we will look, we may live forever, looking, seeing, seeking our own vision. We sometimes tend to define unbelievers as apostates or agnostics. Perhaps that de definition is far too narrow. What about those of us who have received a witness of the divinity of the Savior and yet deep in our hearts do not believe he'll come through for us? We'll believe, we believe he'll do it for others. He'll do it for President Hinckley, for the Quorum of the Twelve, even the stake young women's president, but maybe not for us. Have you ever carefully selected a gift for someone only to present the gift and have it kind of fall flat? Perhaps a simple thanks feels nonchalant and even ungrateful. Similarly, it must be disappointing to the Lord who offered the ultimate sacrifice when we, by our unbelief, essentially refuse his gift and therefore his offer of help. 
Not long ago, a friend who is a respected gospel scholar told me about a fireside he had given on the power of the atonement. Two sisters came up to him afterwards and said, what you've taught us is great, but frankly, it sounds way too good to be true. The Lord's gift to us is too good to be true, which makes a tepid reaction to that gift all the more regrettable. More than once, Nephi chastened his older brothers for their unbelief. Quote, how is it that ye have forgotten that the Lord is able to do all things according to his will for the children of men if it so be that they exercise faith in him? Unquote. How indeed. It's a question we might ask ourselves. The Lord can do all things, but it is our faith in him, even our willingness to believe, that activates the power of the atonement in our lives. We are made alive in Christ because of our faith. I love Nephi's words when he tells his brothers, speaking of the Lord, and he loveth those who will have him to be their God. Or in other words, those who accept him and his gift. One would think it would be easy to embrace and have faith in the gift of the atonement. But let me confess something to you. I fear that some LDS women know just enough about the gospel to feel guilty and that they're not measuring up, but not enough about the atonement to feel the peace and strength it affords us. It was Elder Bruce R. McConkie who said that too often the best kept secret in the church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Perhaps some of us don't know how to draw the power of the atonement into our lives. Maybe others aren't willing to seek its blessings. And then I imagine there's some who just don't ask because they don't feel worthy. It's quite the irony that the gospel of the great Jehovah, which contains the power to save every human being and to strengthen every soul, is sometimes interpreted in such a way that feelings of inadequacy result. Do you remember the exchange in the animated classic, The Lion King, between the deceased King Mufasa and his lion cub Simba, who, returns to, who turns to riotous living after his father's death? Simba sees his father in a vision. And when he attempts to justify his aimless lifestyle, his father teaches him a truth. Simba, you have forgotten who you are because you have forgotten me. As Truman Manson has said, the cruelest thing you can do to a human being is to make him forget that he or she is the son or daughter of a king. There is a direct relationship between our personal experience with the Lord and with our Heavenly Father and with how we see ourselves. The closer we grow to him, the more clear and complete becomes our vision of who we are and what we can become. I have tender feelings about the connection between our faith in the Lord and the way we see ourselves, because I've spent a lot of my life struggling to feel that I measured up. Growing up, I was painfully shy. My mother could tell you dozens of stories to document this. The phrase, social reject, comes to mind. <laughs> to make matters worse, I hit five foot 10 inches in the sixth grade. Can I just tell you, five foot 10 is not a popular height for a girl in the sixth grade. I was an LDS girl in a very non-Mormon community, and the fact that I had a great jump shot and could dribble behind my back didn't do much for me socially. The guys were my best friends, but not my dates. And I was from a farm. Though our little rural town had all of 4,000 residents, three stoplights, there was a clear social distinction between the town kids and the country kids, and I was a country kid. I laugh about it now, but it wasn't very funny then. There was nothing cool about being a tall, sturdy is how my grandma used to describe me, <laughs> Mormon farm girl. I couldn't do what my friends did or, or go where they went. I was different, and for a teenager, different is deadly. The summer after my sophomore year, I had an experience that convinced me I was destined to a life of mediocrity. Our small MIA group came out to BYU to Education Week, and one of the classes I attended was on the dreaded topic of self-esteem. Well, one day, mid-lecture, the presenter, now remember that I'm painfully shy, the presenter suddenly pointed at me and asked me to stand and introduce myself out of the whole group. It's no wonder she selected me. I still remember what I was wearing, a bright yellow print dress that considering my bulk, at the time, probably made me look like something out of AAA tent and awning. 
Well, the sudden attention panicked me, and I could manage nothing more than to mumble my name and slump back down in my chair. I mean, it was absolutely pathetic. I had obviously not demonstrated what the speaker was hoping for, so she pointed to the other side of the room to another young woman in the audience, a tall, thin girl, of course she was thin, with beautiful, long hair. Poise oozed out of the cells of this girl <laughs> as she stood to introduce herself, concluding with a gracious word of thanks to the speaker for her marvelous presentation. All the while I'm thinking to myself, oh, for heaven's sake, she didn't ask for a eulogy, sit down. But the comparison between the two of us was not lost on me. The lecturer did not help things when she said, and I quote, these words are engraven in my memory. It seems that the young girl from Kansas doesn't feel as good about herself as the girl from Salt Lake City. I'm thinking to myself, well, did it take a Phi Beta Kappa to figure out that? <laughs> I can still picture myself in the back seat of our car as we drove home to Kansas. In between little bursts of tears, I contemplated the future and things didn't look that promising. I didn't measure up and I feared that I never would. I wasn't cute enough, smart enough, thin enough, and I didn't come from the right place. Now I don't want to overstate things because I had great experiences growing up and I had disappointing experiences, probably just like you. But I suffered from a deep feeling of inadequacy. My insecurities followed me to college here at the Y, and they affected me socially, scholastically, and spiritually. When during graduate school a friendship ended in a disappointing way, I hopped in my little brown Toyota and drove home for a few days of consolation. For a week, I just moped around the house feeling sorry for myself. Then one afternoon, I walked down to my little brother's room and noticed his journal on the nightstand. Brad was 13, and I thought, it might just be fun to see what pearls of wisdom a 13-year-old boy had written in his journal. His entries were predictable. They were about sports and girls and motorcycles. But then I came to the entry he had made the day I arrived home unexpectedly from school. Sherry came home from BYU today. I'm so glad she's home, but she doesn't seem very happy. I wish there was something I could do to help her because I really love her. As you can imagine, the tears began to just flow. But the sweet emotions unleashed by my brother's words triggered an even more powerful sensation, for almost instantly I had a profound feeling of divine love and acceptance wash over me, and simultaneously a very clear impression that I ought to quit focusing on everything I didn't have because I had enough, and it'd be nice if I'd start doing something with what I did have. For me, it was a profound moment. I didn't pop up and suddenly feel confident about life, but I couldn't deny that the Spirit had spoken and that the Lord loved me and felt I had something to contribute. It was the beginning of seeing myself with new eyes. Now let's fast forward a decade to my early 30s when I faced another personal disappointment, and this one absolutely broke my heart. From a point of view distorted by emotional pain, I couldn't believe that anything or anyone could take away the loneliness or that I would ever be happy again. In an effort to find peace, comfort, and strength, I turned to the Lord in a way I never had before. The scriptures became a lifeline, filled as they were with promises I hadn't noticed in quite the same way, that he would heal my broken heart and take away my pain, that he would succor or run to me and deliver me from disappointment. Fasting and prayer took on new intensity, and the temple became a place of refuge and revelation. What I learned was not only that the Lord could help me, but that he would. Me, a regular farm-grown member of the church with no fancy titles or spectacular callings. It was during that agonizing period that I began to discover how magnificent, how penetrating, and how personal the power of the atonement is. I pleaded day after day, month after month, with the Lord to change my circumstances because I knew I'd never be happy until he did. Instead. He changed my heart. I asked him to take away the burden, but he strengthened me so that I could bear up under the burden. I had always been a believer, but I'm not sure I had understood what or who it was I believed in. 
President George Q. Cannon described what I experienced, quote, when we went forth into the waters of baptism and covenanted with our Father in heaven to serve him and keep his commandments, he bound himself also by covenant to us that he would never desert us, never leave us to ourselves, never forget us, that in the midst of trials and hardships when everything was arrayed against us, he would be near unto us and would sustain us. That was his covenant, unquote. And it all begins with the willingness to believe. For if there be no faith among the children of men, God can do no miracle among them. Do you believe that the Savior will really do for you what he has said he will do, that he can ease the sting of loneliness and enable you to deal with that haunting sense of inadequacy, that he will help you forgive, that he can fill you with optimism and hope, that he will help you resist your greatest temptation and tame your most annoying weakness, that he will respond to your deepest longing, that he is the only source of comfort, strength, direction, and peace that will not change, will not betray you, and will never let you down. An unwillingness to believe that the Savior stands ready to deliver us from our difficulties is tantamount to refusing the gift. It is tragic when we will not turn to him who paid the ultimate price and let him lift us up. Life is a test but divine assistance is available to help us successfully complete this most critical examination of our eternal lives. Since that difficult period 10 years ago, I've had many opportunities to experience the workings of the Lord in my life. He hasn't always given me what I've asked, and the answers have not always come easily, but he has never left me alone, and he has never let me down. Each experience with the Savior leads to greater faith. And as our faith increases, our vision of and confidence about who we are grows clearer. The more we visualize and sense through the impressions of the Spirit our ultimate potential, the more determined we are to achieve it. It is the difference between your mother hounding you to practice the piano and reaching the point where you want to do it yourself. You simply will not be denied the ultimate reward. Now, why is it vital that we, as LDS women, have a clear vision of who we are and what we are about, and a bedrock faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sister Pat Holland said something that I find profound. Quote, if I were Satan and wanted to destroy a society, I think I would stage a full-blown blitz on women, unquote. Is that not exactly what he has done? Hasn't he tried to discourage us and distract us in every conceivable way? Doesn't he try to block our understanding of how vital we are to the plan and purposes of the Lord? Satan wants us neutralized because he knows that the influence of a righteous woman can absolutely reach through the generations. His stated purpose is clear. He desires to make us miserable like he is. He wants us to fail the test and to give up any hope of our own personal big finish. Peter delivered a very sobering warning. Quote, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour." Unquote. Indeed, through eons of practice, the adversary has perfected the arts of deception, deceit, despair, and discouragement. Many of his tactics are bold and brazen and played out daily on everything from the internet to the nightly news. But despite the fact that the adversary's handiwork is outrageously displayed everywhere, pornography, abuse, addiction, dishonesty, violence, and immorality of every variety. Many of his strategies are brilliant for their subtlety. Quote, and others will he pacify and lull them away into carnal security, that they will say, all is well in Zion. Yea, Zion prospereth, all is well. And thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. Unquote. C.S. Lewis said something similar. Quote, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, sop up, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts." Unquote. See if any of the following subtle techniques sound familiar. First, as we've been discussing, Satan tries to blur our vision of why we're here. He would have us distracted by and involved in anything and everything except what we came for. Second, he wants us to feel insignificant that no matter how hard we try, we'll never make much of a difference. Oh, sure, our work is necessary, but not very important. That is a big, fat lie. It is a lie and a diversion designed to keep us so focused on any perceived injustices that we completely overlook the opportunities and privileges that are ours. 
that we underestimate the vital nature of our contribution and that we never come to understand the power we have to change lives. President Henry D. Moyle said, quote, I have a conviction deep down in my heart that we are exactly what we should be, each one of us. I have convinced myself that we have all those peculiar attributes, characteristics, and abilities which are essential for us to possess in order that we may fulfill the full purpose of our creation here upon the earth. The allotment which has come to us from God is a sacred allotment. It is something of which we should be proud, each one of us in our own right, and not wish that we had somebody else's allotment. Our greatest success comes from being ourselves." Unquote. The world can make us feel that we're just another number, to the IRS, to the bank, to the guy who reads the gas meter. Every time I go to New York City on business, and though I absolutely love that city, I feel swallowed up by hundreds of skyscrapers that block the light from reaching the ground, and by a sea of black limousines carrying important people doing imp important things. The sheer number of people can make you feel like a tiny blob in a mass of humanity. And yet, the great Jehovah, the creator of worlds without number, has extended the unparalleled invitation for us to come unto him one by one. He who knows even when the sparrow falls also knows our, name, our names, our needs, and our desires. The gospel with its sanctifying and redeeming power is available to all. Thus we may see that the Lord is merciful unto all, I love that word, all, who will in the sincerity of their hearts call upon his holy name. Yea, thus we see that the gate of heaven is open unto all, even to those who will believe on the name of Jesus Christ." Unquote. There are no qualifiers relative to age, appearance, intellect or talent, marital status, ethnicity, social standing, or church calling. When I think of the times in my life that I have felt excluded because I didn't have the right marital status or the right look or the right social connections, it comforts me to know that the keeper of the ultimate gate has placed no limitation on my accessibility to him. He has invited all of us to come unto him, to learn to hear his voice, to attach and commit ourselves to him, and to ultimately enter his presence. During the Mount Timpanogos temple dedication, President Hinckley said that in the temple there is no aristocracy, only the aristocracy of righteousness. All of us are eligible to come unto him to the extent to which we seek to take upon us the name of Christ and reflect his image in our countenances. For he has promised every soul, every soul, who forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments shall see my face and know that I am. We are not insignificant, not one of us. Don't allow yourself to fall for that deception. Third, Satan tries to wear us down by creating the image that there is nothing glamorous about enduring to the end. It's the very reason I learned the big finish first, to keep the ultimate reward in front of me so that I would keep practicing those difficult, difficult passages that required lots of endurance. I've always hated talks, let me confess, on enduring to the end, because the very phrase makes life seem like drudgery rather than an adventure. And yet, the most haunting regret imaginable would be to pass through the veil and with the full sweep of eternity open before us, realize that we had sold our birthright for a mess of pottage, that we had been deceived by the distractions of Satan, and that there would never be a big finish. Fourth, the adversary encourages us to judge and evaluate each other, a practice that is demeaning to both the person who judges and the one who is judged. I recently had a young woman whose marriage crumbled tell me how much she loves the gospel, but how weary she is of feeling that she'll never be accepted because her life hasn't unfolded as she expected it to. If there is anywhere in the world where every one of us should feel accepted, needed, valued, and loved, it is here as sisters in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We ought to give up telling each other how to live our lives. It is wonderful to talk about principles which apply equally to each of us, but it is rarely helpful to suggest how those principles should be applied. We would do more good by encouraging each other to develop our spiritual sensitivity so that we can receive inspiration about our lives and know how the Lord would direct us to implement eternal principles. Fifth, 
Lucifer, wh Lucifer whispers that life's not fair and that if the gospel were true, we would never have problems or disappointments. I mean, bad things don't happen to good members of the church, should they? He would have us believe that with baptism comes a Magic Kingdom Club card and, and that if our lives aren't like perpetual trips to Disney World, we're getting shortchanged. Well, the gospel isn't a guarantee against tribulation. That would be like a test with no questions. Rather, the gospel is a guide for maneuvering through the challenges of life with a sense of purpose and direction. I feel happy, Brigham Young said. Mormonism has made me all I am, and the grace, the power, and the wisdom of God will make me all that I will ever be, either in time or eternity." Unquote. Sixth, the adversary attempts to numb us into accepting a sliding scale of morality and values. Sometimes rationalization overtakes even the best among us. Our movies don't bother me. You ever heard that? I just go for the story or the music. I skip over the profanity and all those sexually explicit scenes. And yet, advertisers pay millions of dollars for a few seconds of airtime on the bet that during brief but repeated exposure to their product, we'll be persuaded to buy them. If 60 second ads can influence us to spend money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't even like, then then how will minutes, hours, months, and years of watching infidelity, violence, and promiscuity affect us? The litmus test for entertainment of any kind is simple. Can you watch it or participate in it and still have the spirit with you? Seventh, the adversary promotes feelings of guilt about anything. Pick a topic. You can feel guilty for having a large family. I mean, really, how can any one woman possibly care for nine children? Or for having just one child. You're not really doing your duty, are you? For working outside the home. Don't you know what the prophet has said about mothers who seek employment outside the home? Or for choosing to stay home. What's the matter? No ambition? <laughs> Guilt does not originate with the Savior, who invites us to step to a higher way of living and a more ennobling way of thinking, to do a little better and perhaps a little more. Promptings that come from him are hopeful and motivating rather than defeating or discouraging. Eighth, Lucifer works hard to undermine our innate tendency to nurture and care for others. His object is to get us so busy that we don't have time for each other. Voice messaging is great, but it doesn't replace a listening ear and a caring heart. If the adversary can cause us to focus more on our differences than our similarities, if he can keep us so busy running from one commitment to another that we no longer have time for each other, he has made great strides towards neutralizing the strength and influence that we have. We need each other. We need each other's testimonies and strength, each other's confidence and support, understanding and compassion. It is, as Martin Luther said, quote, the kingdom of God is like a besieged city surrounded on all sides by death. Each man and woman has a place on the wall to defend, and no one can stand where another stands, but nothing prevents us from calling encouragement to one another." Unquote. Ninth, the adversary would have us hung up on perfection and stymied by the commandment to become perf perfect. He wants this glorious potential, the big finish, to loom as a giant stumbling block rather than the promise of what, it of what is ultimately possible. In other words, to make the big finish seem little more than a dream. Every prophet in this dispensation has explained that we should not expect to achieve perfection in this lifetime. The goal instead is to become pure so that we are increasingly, increasingly receptive to the promptings of the Holy Ghost. The Savior doesn't want us to be paralyzed by our errors, but to learn from them and grow from them. He sees us as works in progress. The brother of Jared's faith was so strong at one point in his life that he was allowed to behold the Lord. Yet prior to that remarkable event, there was a time when the Lord chastened him for three hours. If the scriptural had ended with the chastening, minus the rest of the story, our impression of this righteous man would be different. Well, the rest of our stories remain to be told. Let us not be unreasonably hard on ourselves. It is purity rather than perfection that we are seeking at this stage of our eternal quest. Tenth, Lucifer would have us be so busy with family, friends, careers, and every soccer league in town 
that there's no time to live the gospel, no time to fast and pray, to immerse ourselves in the scriptures, to worship in the temple, all the things we need to do to study for our mortal test. In other words, he wants us to be a little more concerned with the world than with the gospel, a little more interested in life today than in life forever. Eleventh, he delights in portraying religion as something restrictive and austere rather than liberating and life-giving. He depicts the Father and the Son as aloof rulers rather than our deified Father and elder brother who love us, who have a vested interest in our future, and whose motive is to help see us through this life so that we are worthy to return to them. He paints eternal life as something out of reach, even otherworldly, something for prophets and a few other select people, a condition you and I could never hope to achieve. And he does everything he can to block the memory of our former home. He loves it when we seek for security in bank accounts or social status or professional credentials when ultimate security and peace of mind comes only from a connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. He claims victory when we rely on others for spiritual strength, on husbands and leaders, friends and family members. He doesn't want us to find out how intimate our connection with our father and elder brother can be and how palpable and sustaining their love is. In short, he tries to keep us at arm's length from Jesus Christ. Oh, fine if we profess him to be the Savior, because frankly, talk is cheap. And if the adversary can keep us so distracted that we never really seek, embrace, and commit ourselves to the Lord, then we will also never discover the healing, strengthening power available because of the atonement. We will never know that because of the Savior, we have access to everything we need to pass this test. The antidote to the distractions of the adversary is Jesus Christ. The Savior illuminates our vision of who we are and why we are here and gives us courage to move forward in the journey toward our heavenly home. The potential reward is too good to be true, a big finish that makes Rachmaninoff pale by comparison. Just as Satan's motives have been clearly identified, so are the Savior's, whose express work in glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. For he doeth not anything, save it be for the benefit of the world. For he loveth the world even that he layeth down his own life, that he may draw all men unto him. The contrast between the Savior and Satan is stunning. It is the quintessential difference between light and dark, arrogance and humility, self-interest and charity, power used to destroy and power used to bless. It is the battle between good and evil personified. Eleven years ago, President Ezra Taft Benson issued this challenge, quote, there has never been more expected of the faithful in such a short period of time than there is of us. Never before on the face of this earth had the forces of evil and the forces of good been so well organized. The final outcome is certain. The forces of righteousness will win. But what remains to be seen is where each of us will stand in the battle and how tall we will stand. Great battles can make great heroes and heroines. My dear sisters, you who have been called to live and work and raise families in the twilight of the dispensation of the fullness of times are nothing best than the Lord has ever had. You are heroines in every sense of that word, which is why the Lord needs us to arise and be everything we can be. President Howard W. Hunter put it this way, quote, there is a great need to rally the women of the church to stand with and for the brethren in stemming the tide of evil that surrounds us and in moving forward the work of our Savior. Only together can we accomplish the work he has given us to do and be prepared for the day when we shall see him." Unquote. I believe him. The impact of righteous, determined, pure-hearted women today is immeasurable. It doesn't matter where you live, whether or not you have children, how much money you have, or how talented you think you are or are not. This is a day when the Lord and his kingdom need women who are firmly grounded in their testimony of Jesus Christ, women of vision who have their, their sights trained on the purpose of life, women who can hear the voice of the Lord, expose the distractions of the adversary for what they are, and press forward with a sense of purpose and a desire to contribute, women who are articulate as well as compassionate, women who understand who they are and where they're going and are determined to not let anything keep them from getting there. 
I believe that good women all over the world are desperate for leadership, for role models, for the assurance borne out in lives well lived that families are important, that virtue is not outdated, and that it is possible to feel peace and purpose in a society spinning out of control. Sisters, we have the reason to be the most reassured, the most determined, the most confident of all women. In saying this, I don't mean to minimize our personal challenges, but we know what we're here for, and we know that we are beloved of the Lord. Remember President Spencer W. Kimball's statement nearly 20 years ago about the vital role righteous women would play during the winding up scenes of this dispensation? We are in the winding up scenes. I have a friend who's an executive with a Fortune 500 company. One day we sparred verbally over a definition of the word power. His response interested me. He said, power is influence. Well, if my friend is right, and I am, in, I am inclined to agree with him, then collectively and individually, we have tremendous power because the influence of the sisters of this church is overwhelming. We need not be shy or apologetic about who we are and what we believe. Nowhere else in the world are there 4.1 million women who, because of their beliefs and vision of the eternal possibilities, seek after and defend all that is virtuous, lovely, of good report, or praiseworthy. Women who are devoted to building, lifting, helping, and loving. Talk about influence. Who is better suited to defend the sanctity of home and family? Who better prepared to celebrate virtue and integrity? Who better to demonstrate by example that women can be strong and savvy and articulate without being shrill or angry or manipulative? Are we not like Captain, Moron Captain Moroni's armies, who though vastly outnumbered were quote, inspired by a better cause, for they were not fighting for monarchy nor power, but they were fighting for their homes and their liberties, yea, for their rights of worship and their church, unquote. You and I comprise a pivotal battalion in the army of the Lord. Remember what happened when Captain Moroni hoisted the title of liberty? Quote, behold, whosoever will maintain this title upon the land, let them come forth in the strength of the Lord, unquote. May we arise as sisters in this, the greatest cause on earth. May we go forward together in the strength of the Lord. More than ever, he needs our faith and faithfulness, our vitality and our ingenuity, our unwavering commitment and our conviction. We are witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ, the living capstone of all that has come before us and a vital link to all that lies ahead. This life is a test. It is also a glorious privilege. May we work toward the kind of big finish the Apostle Paul described as he anticipated his journey back home, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord shall give me at that day. May we build and keep the faith. May we go forward together with a clear vision of who we are, what we are about, and how vital our contribution is to the Lord's kingdom. This is the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We can make the difference the Lord needs us to make. I know we can. More importantly, he knows we can. For in the strength of the Lord, we can do all things. In his sacred and holy name, amen.